for setting your clocks ahead and getting here on time. So let's give Chris a round of applause. To the church of God that is in Corinth. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Called to be saints together with all those who are in every place. Call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. For, For the, the body, body does, does not, not consist of one, one member, but of many. As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. If one member suffers, all suffer. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Amen. Noodling, or as you may have heard it called, hand fishing, is a technique that, just as the name implies, involves an angler. I don't even know if you can call them an angler if they're not using a, a fishing rod. But they are fishing with their bare hands. And the prize, a catfish. Catfish. Now, these catfish, they're not pretty. They're not pretty, right? They're pretty ugly, actually. And unfortunately, you can't see, you can't see the caption on this picture, but what the caption says is that um, catfish are anything but pretty. But this is a, a technique that's been around for, for hundreds and hundreds of years and has recently started to gain some traction in the southern part of the state. And I'm going to tell you a little bit here about noodling, but I want to also preface this by giving you a little PSA. It is not legal in Maine, okay? So, so don't go out in the Androscoggin River and, and try <laughs> to go noodling. But I want to tell you a little bit about this process of noodling. And so the, the first thing that, that someone who wants to get involved in noodling needs to do is, is they need to learn a little bit about the catfish. Where do they, when do they spawn? What are, their, what are their feeding tactics? And so now the catfish is, an, is what they would call an ambush predator. And so the, the catfish, what they do is they hide around rocks and they hide in holes in the riverbanks. And so if you want to go noodling, you're going to have to get down in the water and, and go to actually where these catfish live. And what it involves here is, is really kind of going down deep, blindly. And you see here that the, that the water around here is, the, you can't see in the water. And, and so this, this gentleman here is blindly reaching his hand into a hole. And it's, so it requires that you get dirty. It requires that you get dirty, and, I, and I, as you look at this, I'm sure that you can all agree that this is a pretty unconventional method of fishing. Now, the other thing I want to tell you is you might want to say, well, how, okay, so they stick their arm in a hole. How do they actually catfish? Well, what they do is they find out that the catfish is actually inside the hole, and because the catfish has no way out, in an effort to defend themselves, they will bite the angler's arm. That is the act of noodling. And so if you Google, I Googled noodling to see where the, the name came up, and there were a whole, whole bunch of things came up, like basically, and the, the one that I liked the most was that if you're doing this, you're out of your noodle, right? That's where it, that's where it actually came up. But, um, but you, you got to get in there. you got to get in there. you got to get dirty. you got to commit. you got to commit to that hole. And so as you can imagine, this process, it's not quick, right? It's not quick. It takes time to, to feel your way along. Because as I said, you can't see in the water there. And so you have to feel your way along the riverbank and then actually stick your hand in when you find a hole and hope that it's not a snake or something else. Now these catfish, which you're going to see here in a second, that catfish is, is pretty darn big. Anglers, these, these noodlers, they don't do this alone. They have spotters, which will actually grab them by their belt to help pull them out, because as you can imagine, if you've ever caught a fish, it doesn't come lightly. It thrashes all over the place. And so they have these people who are, who are called spotters to actually help them out of the water. And then the reward, ultimately, the reward is to get the fish. Now this fish here is, 
Um, the next slide. This, this next slide here will show you the largest catfish ever caught. 106-pound catfish that this gentleman brought in on his arm. I'm sure you didn't come to church this morning. You didn't set your clocks ahead expecting to come and get, you know, a, a lesson on noodling. So where am I going with this? Well, you see, noodling is a lot like the topic that we're going to talk about today, and that's discipleship. It's a lot like discipleship. You see, if, if we're going to seek disciples, that's what the definition, I'll get into that a little bit more, but that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who goes out and tries to make more disciples, disciple making. And in order to do that, we can't just sit back, can we? We're going to make disciples. Jesus called us to make disciples. We can't just sit back. We have to go to the people who need to be discipled. Just like if you're going to go noodling, you have to go and find where the catfish are. You have to seek them out. And much like the second picture that I showed you, commit, right? As a, as a, as a, as a noodler, you have to commit to sticking your hand in the hole, and you're going to get a little dirty. And that can be the way that things go for us when we decide to get into discipling someone else. Sometimes it can get dirty. Sometimes we might have to get down in their stuff to really truly help them. And we can't assume that they're always going to come willingly, right? We can't assume that they're going to come willingly because just like that catfish, maybe if we start to push a little bit on those people that we're trying to disciple, maybe they get a little aggressive. Maybe they bite. We can't always anticipate that they're just going to be welcoming. They might not actually enjoy the correction that you're trying to give them. And so it could get a little bit dirty. And you know when we attempt to disciple people. We also know that we don't have to do this alone. Amen. We have our Lord and Father that will help us. But this is where we can work with other people, other Christians, lock arms with others to help disciple people. And then the reward, I don't have to tell you what the reward is, right? It's that eternal reward that you have for that person. And in and that opportunity that they have to meet Jesus and invite him into their lives. Well, good morning, Church of the Mid-Coast. Welcome home. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris. I'm on the pastoral team here. And as Stacy said, I'm really glad that uh, you set your clocks ahead, got here on time. If you're joining us online, we get it. We love you. You're better off staying home if you were late. So <laughs> we're happy that you're joining us either way. But... I want to just take a minute here because I think that it's vitally important for us to kind of make sure that we're getting into the right place, Lord. And I want to just start us off here with prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we are, you are so great. You are so great and powerful, and that is such a message that we need to hear and that others need to hear, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for this message that you have, you have brought to me and that you have, you have, I hope that you and pray that you will speak through me today, Lord. Lord. I just ask that you would just remove distractions. We know that there is so much out there right now that is distracting people, distracting people from you, Lord, which is so incredibly tragic. And Lord, we just, I want you to use this opportunity this morning to just remove those distractions. Help each and every single person hearing this message today to just remove those distractions, put them aside, because I know that they will be blessed if they will just listen if they will just see and seek and listen. Lord, just ask, ask you to have your hands of blessing upon this message. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, are you a disciple of Christ? You know, as I, as I was preparing this message, I, I found a definition of a disciple that I think is absolutely perfect. And it's this. A disciple is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. A disciple is following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and committed to the mission of Jesus. Those things are vitally important if we want to be successful as disciples. And this definition that I just presented to you, that's, it's taken from the scripture from Matthew and Mark that talks about Jesus calling 
the first disciples. And now we see this calling specifically, he's calling Simon and Andrew, who are two fishermen. It says this, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they were fishing. Jesus called on to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. Think about that definition that I just gave you. Disciple is following Jesus. What does Jesus say? He says, follow me. Being changed by Jesus, we know that that will happen. We know the story. And being committed to the mission of Jesus. And we see what they did. When Jesus said, follow me, they dropped what they were doing and followed him. You may have heard this a little bit differently because the English Standard Version, it translates it a little more famously. And it says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men is what Jesus says in the English Standard Version. And we're going to use this passage today as our foundational verse. And my prayer for you today is that you will leave here with a better understanding of what it means to be a disciple. And more importantly, I hope and pray that you understand how absolutely vital, how absolutely essential it is for us to be disciples in today's world. You know, a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, we went to Camp Monadnock. We took 12 youth up over to Camp Monadnock in, in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. And, and, I, and I hope that if you had a child go there, I, I hope that you're, you're, you were connecting with them and, and asking them, what was their experience like? But I will tell you that the beauty of volunteering for going to something like that for an adult is that it's not just the kids that God speaks into when you're there. It's me. And when I was there, one of the things that God really impressed upon me as I was sitting there and I was watching the kids worship and I was listening to the, to the message being preached is the fact that we have important work to do. The things that we do are important. And you heard Pastor Kevin talk a little bit last week about the importance of, of discipling our youth, influencing our youth, because we're in a crisis. Our world, our nation, we are in an absolute crisis right now. And as Pastor Kevin said last week, we need to go back to making the church the center of the community. And if we're going to do that, we need to get to work making disciples. We need to get to work. You and I need to get to work making disciples. So I'm going to take a minute here just to unpack this scripture that I just read to you. And, and I want to give you a little bit of a context to the passage because I think that one, it, it just speaks to, the, to where Jesus' heart was. And the first thing I want you to understand is that where Jesus was looking for the disciples, where did it say he was? He was walking along the Sea of Galilee. And a little bit of historical fact for you is that, that um, Galilee was, was really thought of as being where the outcasts went. In society, they were, very, they were really looked down upon by the Jews of the time kind of as the, as the cast-offs. And so when we read that Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and we also need to remember that where, where was the majority of Jesus' teaching? It was in Galilee. And that just speaks to the heart that Jesus had for the lost. Speaks to the heart that he had for the lost. And as I said, you know, Galilee at the time, this is, this is where kind of the outcasts went. This is where the, the people who were, quote, unquote, on the outside lived. The people there, they had, they had very little value in the eyes of the Jews of the Old Testament. This is a model that, that you and I should be following as well. Jesus knew the sense of urgency that he had to save the lost, and, and we could do a multitude of other messages on saving the lost, going into the parables about saving the lost. But the point here that I want to make today is that, that we need to develop that same urgency to reach the lost that Jesus had, to disciple others. The other thing I want you to see here from the scripture is that Jesus met them where they were. He met them 
where they were. He didn't call them because they were theologians. They were just ordinary guys. They were fishermen. They were ordinary people, just like you and I. Just like you and I. And we see here from the scripture that, that he speaks to them in terms that they'll get it. He doesn't say, Simon, Peter, come with me. We're going to change the world. What do you think would have they, were the, their response been if he said to two fishermen, come on, come with me. We're going to change the world. They didn't know Jesus that well at this time. There are some, there are some historical um, lineages that, that say that they did know each other on some, some degree, but we don't really know that for sure. No, he didn't say that to them. He said, come with me. He spoke to them in a language that they would understand. He knew that they were fishermen. So he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And he did this as a means of helping them to see how God could work through them. You know, American philosopher Dallas Willard once wrote, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Think about that for just a second. Does that display the gravity and the importance of discipleship? So if we've made the decision to accept Christ into our lives, we've ultimately made the decision to be a disciple. And if we're going to do that, we need to understand what it takes if we want to be a disciple that makes disciples, if we want to be fishers of men, we first need to follow. That's the first thing that we need to do. You know, Jesus says to Simon and, and Peter, he says, follow me, follow me. Following Jesus means following his teachings and following his example. Following his teachings and following his example. There are two, two pieces to this. You know, soon after he calls his disciples together, he delivers the most famous sermon ever given, the Sermon on the Mount. And in that sermon, he teaches them basic principles of discipleship and of the Christian life. And then when he's done, Jesus concludes with a promise, a promise to those people who who will follow his word, to his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, it says this. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows, it is wise. Like a person who builds his house on solid rock. Though the rain comes and the torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds his house on sand. When the rains and floods came and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. In this scripture, Jesus is giving us his support because he knows the life that we're going to lead as Christians. He knows what we're going to encounter when we attempt to disciple others. You know, as I said earlier, we live in a time where there is such crisis. And it's really easy. It's really easy. And I, I, I can't believe here that I'm the only one that you really could kind your, find yourself going to that dark place. And, and I had that happen to me this week. I was driving into work, and you just find yourself spiraling, spiraling out of control with fear, with anxiety. And I thank God that I had a relationship with Christ, that I have a relationship with Christ that allowed me, because that's spiritual warfare right there, folks. When you start to feel, when you start to be afraid, when you start to become anxious, that's spiritual warfare. And I'm so thankful that I have a relationship with Jesus that I was able to just sit in my car before I got out and went into, my, into work. And I said, dear Jesus, just... Just be with me today. Be with me today and help me focus on only those things that are positive. And help me be life-giving today. And you know what? It came through. It came through. You have to have faith. 
You have to have faith. I, I, I heard this, this, uh, this commentator talking about faith, and, and he was talking about, like, you know, when you, when you, when you incorporate people and, and you come across people that, that they want to question faith. And the next time that somebody does that, say, you know what? I don't know how my car works. I'm not a mechanic, but you know what? I have faith that when I turn that key, it's going to come on. I don't know about electricity, but I have faith that when I, turn, when I flip that switch, the lights are going to come on. We put our faith in things every single day. Everyone does. Everyone does. Putting their faith in those things that they don't understand. So we're called to follow Jesus' example. In John chapter 12, Jesus provides his disciples with an example of how to be a servant leader. So we want to follow his teachings, and we want to follow his example. So in Jesus' time, just to give you a little bit of a background, in Jesus' time it was customary for the feet to be washed before eating. And this was important due to the fact that at the time, people were wearing sandals, and you can imagine that their feet were absolutely filthy. That, combined with the fact that they were eating on low tables, meant that their feet were often in view or in close proximity. Is anyone besides me that has a teenage boy thankful that we don't have low tables? <laughs> I have a hard enough time getting my son Spencer to wash his hands. I can't imagine having him wash his feet before we ate too. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. But what do we see Jesus doing here in John? He washes their feet. He washes their feet before the meal. He's giving them an example of how to be a servant leader. And this is what he says to them afterwards. And I, since your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are no greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than anyone who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. He was being a servant leader. He was giving the disciples, he was giving us an example of how we should live our lives and how we should disciple. And now, what I want you to take note of here, though, that I think that it's very easy for you and I to kind of follow and fall into this, is that, that as with everything else that we learn, it really all goes back to the heart. What's your motive? What's your motive? Are you, are you serving? Are you doing something out of, out of obligation or out of guilt? Or are you doing it out of love? Because that's important. That's important. Because Jesus didn't do things out of obligation. He didn't wash the disciples' feet out of obligation. He didn't wash the disciples' feet out of guilt. He did it out of love. And so if we're going to follow his example, that's the way that we need to follow it. He doesn't, we need to do things from a position of love, not from obligation or of guilt. The second thing that disciples do is disciples help others follow Jesus. They help others follow Jesus. Last week in his message, Pastor Kevin talked about the importance of participating in the development of the next generation. And I couldn't agree with him more. And this means discipling youth in our community. To be a follower is to help others follow him. And interestingly enough, if you, if you think back in the Bible, it's, this, is, this is a pattern that of discipleship was a pattern that was occurring even before Christ was even mentioned in Scripture. If you're following along with us during the, in the, reading the Bible every day on the, the Bible recap, two days ago, we just started the book of Deuteronomy. And where the book of Deuteronomy starts is with Moses speaking to the next generation of Israelites. Now, you know, we talk about these God winks, these things, like, th that's not coincidence, folks, that I get into the beginning of Deuteronomy at, as I'm preparing this message. That's not, a, that's not coincidence. But Moses is actually talking to the next generation of Israelites, and he's, he's telling them 
of all of the, the, the pitfalls that the, the generations before them had had. And we need to understand that, that this has been something that's gone on forever. In Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6 through 7, this is exactly what Moses said to the Israelites. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What is he telling them? He's telling them that they need to disciple. They need to continue to disciple the next generation. And there are some things that we can do specifically as we disciple the next generation. The first thing is we can help them apply their Christian faith to every area of their lives. This includes things like prayer, fellowship, worship, Bible study, ministry, and evangelism. You know, as I said, we took uh, this group of, of 12 students to Monadnock about a month ago. And one of the things that, that I really, truly appreciate about a camp like this, and we actually, we actually challenged the students on Friday night when they got there. And we challenged them. We said, are, are you going to be real? Are you going to be real this weekend? Are you going to be open this weekend? And I love the, the, the gentleman, uh, his name was Jonas, who was leading the worship. And he challenged the students too, and he said, do not waste this opportunity. Don't waste this opportunity. Those are seeds that are being planted. Seeds that are being planted right there. The other thing that we can do when we disciple this next generation is we could talk, about, talk to them through tough issues. Teach them how to make good decisions. You know, today's youth, they're faced with a multitude of other issues that, and, and temptations and challenges that, that the majority of us here didn't have to face. And giving them the tools and resources to help them to navigate these challenges is critical. Even more troubling is the growing evidence that teens and other youth are less likely to, than their parents as Christian and more likely to say that they are religiously unaffiliated. So even more troubling is the growing evidence that the teens and other youth are less likely than their parents to identify as Christian and are more likely to say they are religiously unaffiliated. Let that sink in for a second. I'm going to read to you this little excerpt here from, from a, a commentary that I found. And it says this, American young people are theoretically fine with religious faith, but it does not concern them very much. And it is, and I underline this in my notes, not durable enough to survive on after they graduate high school. Pastor Kevin gave us some statistics last week about the number of students who walk away from their faith when they leave high school, they get into college. That's because what they're learning and what, how they're being discipled when they're in high school is not durable enough to survive once they graduate. One more thing. We're responsible. Kendra Casey, who wrote the book, Almost Christian, what the faith of our teenagers is telling us, is telling the American church. As one of the original researchers for the National Study of Youth and Religion, an associate pastor of youth, church, and culture at Princeton Seminary, Dean has been forced to come to the same conclusion that so many other researchers have come to. Young people in our churches are not being discipled in a way that leads to active faith as adults. Young people in our churches are not being discipled in a way that leads to active faith as adults. Here's another, here's another observation from that same book. Here's a quote. Since the religious and spiritual choices of American teenagers echo with astonishing clarity the religious and spiritual choices of the adults who love them, 
lackadaisical faith is not young people's issues, but ours. In a nutshell, our failure, our failure to, display, to dis- disciple today's youth, it has generational consequences. Generational cons- consequences. Those of us who are, who are Christian adults, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to build up this generation through intentional discipleship. We need to begin building this generation, as David wrote in the book of Psalms, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. This is what our goal is. If we're going to disciple this next generation, we need to help them to follow Jesus. But there's only one way that discipleship can be effective. There's only one way, and it's through intentional relationships. If we go back to the noodling analogy that I talked to you about at the very onset here, the first step was to do what? The first step was to learn about the fish. In order for us to get to know the people that we're supposed to be discipling, it's going to take a deep and honest relationship. As I said, people need to be able to be in a relationship where they can be real, where they can be without judgment, when they can reveal their hurts, their habits, and hang-ups. In all honesty, this is one of the reasons why Celebrate Recovery is so incredibly powerful. If you haven't heard of Celebrate Recovery, you heard Stacy talk a little bit about it. It's a Christian-based group that meets right here, Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock. And it's a p- place where, where people can share their struggles. And most importantly, be around people who love them and who are not going to judge them. You know another place where intentional relationships start and flourish? Right here. Right here in church. Pastor Kevin spoke last week about the importance of making church a priority. And although watching online is great, we love you if you're watching us online, there's nothing like the fellowship that occurs right here. Seeing someone face-to-face, giving them a hug, sharing a cup of coffee, There's nothing that can replace the fellowship that occurs from being here in person. And while these structured discipling opportunities in kind of like a formal setting are important and effective, the spontaneous ones are just as important. That's why we feel so strongly here about the importance of getting together outside of Sunday service. Whether it's something like CR that I mentioned earlier, or the first Friday events that we host every month, or men's group, the men's breakfast, men's outings, like the hockey game, opportunity to bring for their dads, to bring their kids to a hockey game and hang out, our women's discipleship group that meets on Fridays, or even just getting together with somebody with, for a cup of coffee. We need to understand that, that those, are, those are critical opportunities that we have for discipleship. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 says this, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. Every moment presents an opportunity to discuss God, who he is, and what he's doing in your life. Since we're always following Jesus, we always have the opportunity to help others follow him as well. And you'll hear at Church of the Midcoast, one of the other ways that we practice discipleship is through our daily reading plans. And I've been so encouraged as of late with the number of people that we have that have joined these plans. So this week, I want to invite you all to join us in a devotional called Discipleship, The Road Less Taken. Now, I will give you fair warning. It is 12 days, so we're going to stretch you a little bit. You're going to have a little bit of overlap. But Greg Laurie is the author of this, and, and Greg Laurie is a, is a pastor at a, at a larger church. And I've had the opportunity to, to kind of review the devotions for each day, uh, and they're so incredibly powerful. You're going to love it. So you can either take a picture of the QR code there. We'll get you to the, to the Bible app, 
or you'll be getting an invitation later on. So now that we've covered the basis for discipleship here this morning, I want to give you three practical ways that you can be fishers of men. Remember back to my noodling example. The first thing that we need to do is we need to find where they are. Find where they are. If you're going noodling, once you find where that catfish is, you need to go where they live and find them in the river. Discipling is the same way. There are people all around you, and it's, it doesn't going to take you, that, take you that long. It's not that hard to do. There are people all around you in your circles of influence who don't know Jesus. All around you that don't know Jesus. So I want you to take a minute. Think about it right now. Who, who in your circle of influence doesn't know Jesus. I also want you to challenge yourself a little bit. How could you share the gospel with them? And I'm not saying, you know, beat them over the head with the Bible, present them with the Bible tomorrow morning when you go to work. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. But you have to be open and look for the opportunities that you have to share the love of Jesus with them. I have a good friend of mine from college that uh, we get together with on occasion and, and he's seeking. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call him uh, someone who goes to church regularly. He does believe in God. but um, And it's been awesome to see how when God has revealed opportunities for me to disciple him a little bit. Whether it's just praying for him. You know, I had an opportunity. He, the last, one of the last times we got together, he was talking about uh, the fact that, you know, he was going to work and he was experiencing chest pains on his way to work. And he's a, he's a fit guy. And, and so I, in my head, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to start praying for him. And he was also reading this book. It's interesting. It's interesting how people who don't necessarily have a, a relationship with Jesus will, will look at things sometimes. And, and um, I was talking to him on the, on the phone a couple weeks later, and I said, oh, hey, how you doing? How you feeling? And and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, feeling all, I'm feeling a lot better, you know. And he was reading a book on, you know, calming your mind. And he's like, yeah, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's amazing, you know, how, how healthy and how good reading a book on, you know, like calming your mind, what, what, that, what that will do to your anxiety. And I said, that and the prayers from a friend. Just little opportunities, little nudges like that that you have are so incredibly powerful. You know, it's also important to remember that one way that we can disciple, remember, if we're going to disciple, we're going to follow Jesus' teaching. If we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, we need to follow his teaching and follow his example. And so the other way that we can disciple others is by the way that we live our lives. If you ever come to the men's breakfast, you'll have an opportunity to talk about how powerful that has been for Sam in his life. How he's, over the years, had so many people that have said, ah, you know, you don't do this anymore. You don't, you, don't do the, you don't act this way anymore. Great testimony to the impact that Jesus can have in our lives. But just remember, as I said, what happens to the catfish when they feel cornered? They bite, right? They bite. So we need to to be prepared that, as I said earlier, that people aren't going to necessarily always be as open as we'd like. You know, back to that example at Monadnock, it was really interesting to see and to, to step back as, as one of the leaders of the group because there were definitely varying levels of being open across the group. You know, we had some people that were, they were some, of the, some of the kids, they were all in. They were all, they were all about it. And there were some kids on Friday, Friday night when we got there, and you see them, and they're, they were doing the worship, and they're seeing the matches, and, and you see they were a little bit stiff, right? They're a little bit stiff. And then on Saturday, they start to soften a little bit. They start to get in, start to, start to have some fellowship, start to have fun. And then there are some, quite honestly, that, that on Sunday, they were still a little bit like, okay, you know what? But the bottom line that we need to remember here is that seeds are being planted. Seeds are being planted. 
Pastor Kevin is, and, and again, I, I want to encourage you just what Stacy said. If you didn't get an opportunity to see Pastor Kevin's message last week, go up online and watch it. Incredibly powerful. But one of the things that he talked about in there was he talked about this survey that was done of teens and all the things that teens wish their parents knew that they didn't tell us. And he went through a whole list. But the bottom line here is that, that we need to understand that we aren't always necessarily going to see the fruit. We're not going to see the fruit. But we need to plant the seed. So the second way to be a fisher of men is to bait the hook. Now I will tell you one of my one of my greatest faults is patience or lack thereof. Fishing is I have no interest in fishing, like the literal fishing. When I was a kid, I remember being with my grandfather, he worked on a lake and I will tell you the only time I actually ever fished was when I saw a fish off the dock. That would be the time that I would run and get the fishing pole, was when I saw a fish. I, do, I just don't have the patience. But with discipleship, you can't rush the process. We have to be patient. You have to play the long game. Remember, we're the, what we're doing is we're making investments in eternity here. We're making investments in eternity when we disciple others. So we need to just plant the seed, just like I talked about those kids at Mananak. We just need to plant the seed. And the final way that we can be fishers of men is that we need to focus on casting the net, not how many fish we catch. We need to focus on casting the net, not how many fish we catch. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're responsible for getting people saved. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible will it say that we are responsible for getting people saved. What are we responsible for? Sharing the love of Jesus. That's what we're responsible for. Our responsibility is to share the gospel. Because inevitably, guess what? It's not about you and I. It's not about us. In 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes, and this is key, it's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. That's you and I. It doesn't matter who's planting the seed or who waters it. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field, you are God's building. All that God wants for us is to just do our part. And any good fisherman tell, will tell you that you have absolutely no control over the number of fish that you catch. And the same is true with the gospel. So as you go out to be a fisher of men this week and share the gospel, don't worry about how many people get saved. You can't control that. Worry about how many nets you throw. How many opportunities do you capitalize on? You know, when it comes to Christians being fishers of men and sharing the gospel, this is what Jesus wants you to focus on. This is what he wants you to focus on. So are you a disciple of Christ? My prayer for you this week is that you will consider how you can reach those people who don't know Jesus. Prayerfully consider how you can reach those people. Really spend time praying about that. And once you've done that, just be open. Just be open to those promptings from the Holy Spirit. Have your eyes open, have your ears open, and be willing. Look for ways to share the gospel and use your influence to be fishers of men. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I just thank you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending your son to be with us, to be with us and teach us and be an example for how we should be discipling others. Lord, I just, I ask that you just give each and every person here the strength, give them the courage to step out this week, to step out this week, to recognize those opportunities that you're, prevent, you're presenting to them and give them the courage to just step out and share the gospel in whatever way that you prompt them. Lord, we know that that's all you want from us. We, we have faith, Lord, that 
if we plant the seeds, that you will sow the harvest. Lord, we just love you, and we thank you for the impact that you have on our lives. Lord, we just help, we, we thank you and we love you for helping us to grow and for giving us this powerful task of discipling others. Lord, we know this is an absolutely critical time in our world, in our community, in our nation. And it's time for us to rise up. It's time for us to rise up as, as Christians, as believers, and speak your word boldly. Lord, just pray that you'll give people opportunities this week. We know that they will present themselves. And again, we just ask for courage. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a wonderful message. Let's stand to our feet.